Hi. Here we go. So chapter one talks about business and the environment and economics. Here are our learning objectives. So describe the relationship between profit and risk and show how businesses and nonprofit organizations can raise the standard of living for all. Two, describe how each of the five elements of the business environment affect business. Three, explain business, e explain basic economics. Four, compare and contrast the various types of economic systems and explain the trend toward mixed economies. Number five, describe the economic system of the United States, including the significance of key economic indicators, especially GDP, productivity, and the business cycle. Number six, contrast fiscal policy and monetary policy and explain how each affects the economy. And finally, number seven, review how past trends are being repeated in the present and what those trends mean for tomorrow's college graduates. Now, what you can get just from the learning objectives is that we have a language here that we need to learn, the language of business. So as you're going through your readings and doing your research, make sure you spend some time in the glossary at the end of the chapter. Make sure you have a clear understanding of the terms that they're using. It'll make everything a whole lot easier. Business, let's get a definition. An activity that seeks to provide goods and services to others while operating at a profit. That's the basic. Businesses take in revenue. This is accounting for those of you who take in bookkeeping or accounting. Businesses take in revenue in order to gain a profit while avoiding a loss. If revenue is higher than expenses, then there's a profit. If revenue is less than expenses, you have a loss. If a business loses money over time, it will close and put people out of work. The importance of entrepreneurs. Well, let's get a definition of entrepreneur first. Entrepreneurs take the risk of starting a business. They put up the capital in order to get it going. Entrepreneurs earn money for themselves by taking the risk. They employ others, so they create jobs. And they pay taxes and help their community. Stakeholders. Stakeholders are anyone who gains or loses from the business's policies includes customers, employees, stockholders, suppliers, dealers, bankers, people in the surrounding community. A lot of times when we think about stakeholders and businesses, we forget about the people who live in the community around the business. Businesses need to recognize and respond to the needs of their stakeholders. So here's kind of a breakdown of all the stakeholders. Often the needs of a firm's various stakeholders will conflict. For example, paying employees more, and we're seeing more and more increases in hourly wages, may cut into stockholders' profits. So you got stockholders here, and you got employees. Give them raises, they get less, unless the company makes more profit. Here we see a graph of women in the workforce, and we see how the biggest increase, the biggest percentage, is women college grads. That should give you more incentive to get your degree. Here are the five elements in the business environment. The economic and legal environment, the technological environment, the competitive environment, the social environment, and global business. In the, under the economic and legal environment, a country's economic system and laws can have a strong impact on level of risk. Obviously, in this country, private ownership. There are many countries in the world where they don't have private ownership of business, or it takes a lot to get it, and the legal system. The technological environment includes everything from phones to computers, mobile devices, medical imaging machines, and so forth. Technology can make businesses more effective and efficient. Um, 
being as old as I am, <laughs> I remember days before the internet, before the World Wide Web, which is what WWW stands for, by the way. The web allowed businesses to become automatically international, right? I put my website up there to try to sell my, sell my stuff, and everybody in the world can see that. The competitive environment. Companies need high-quality products and service at competitive prices. Companies must understand their customers' wants and needs. Obviously, that's part of what the decisions that businesses make when they open in the beginning. What do people need? What do they want? Or we have an idea for a product, but do people really need that product? Companies need strong relationships with suppliers and companies must differentiate themselves. Steve Jobs from Apple created, <coughs> created the iPhone in 2007. Nobody thought they'd need a, a cell phone until the iPhone came out. And all of a sudden, everybody wanted one. And that was, that was one of the things that Steve Jobs did the best, was he anticipated what was going to be needed. People didn't even know before he created the products that they would need them. The social environment, the population's demography impacts buying patterns. So this is looking at who, who and what in the area. Where are we going to sell to? Who are our customers? Demography by age 2020. So 39% of the country is between 25 and 54. That's you guys. We've got 13% 15 to 24, 13% 55 to 64, 65 and over, 18.8. 13.8. What is that? Not sure. Anyway, you can see that the, the, large, the largest group by age in the United States is 25 to 54, which is where most commercials are geared. Who will support? Social Security is a big topic that I talk about in my payroll class. We don't have enough time to talk about it here, but I'll simply say that this is part of the problem with regards to Social Security. Num notice. In 1950, there were seven workers working for every person on Social Security. In 2020, it's four. The projection here is to have two people working for every person on Social Security. That's because all the baby boomers will be on retired. So who's paying for all the baby boomers to collect Social Security? This downward trend is the problem with Social Security. The global environment includes trade agreements, international economic conditions, war and terrorism, and climate change. And we've all seen over the last six months how the war in Ukraine with, the, with Ukrainians and Russia, what it's done to food. There are a lot of countries in Africa that have been waiting to get grain from Ukraine. They can't, they live on their their basic food is bread, and they can't make it without the wheat from Ukraine. All, they're all, that war is also affecting gas prices. Economics. So macroeconomics is looking at the big view. Uh, what should the U.S. do to lower its national debt? That's a big view. Include gross, gross domestic product, unemployment rate, and price indexes. Microeconomics, why do people buy smaller cars when gas prices go up? Good question, but that's a micro question. Resource development, creating new ways to produce goods and creating conditions to make better use of them. So for a company, they're typically looking for how do I make things better, faster, cheaper? Here are the five factors of production. Land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship. There's that person taking the risk again to get everything moving. And knowledge. Command economies. Socialism, communism. 
command be because they're because they are run by the by the government. Free market economies, capitalism. Now, everybody's heard socialism, but maybe not everyone understands what socialism is. Socialism in socialism, it benefits the benefit is more social equality, free education, health care, child care. It takes away business people's incentives, leads to brain drain, meaning intelligent business people, scientists move out of the country because they can make more elsewhere. It tends to result in fewer inventions and less innovation. Now, communism is different than socialism. Communism intrudes further into people's lives than socialism. Some communist countries do not allow their citizens to practice certain religions, change jobs, or move to another town. China is a good example of a communist state where the government has total control over what you do and how you do it. Government does not know what to produce because prices do not reflect supply and demand. Now, one thing about China that we have to understand is that they picked up some, <coughs> excuse me, they picked up some capitalist, uh, capitalist qualities over time. And that's why they become such a, such a powerhouse in the world. Understanding free market capitalism. Businesses operated for profit. Business people make all the decisions. This is something that we're familiar with. This is the way American companies work. No country is pure capitalist, including the United States. Government may determine minimum wages, set farm prices, lend money to businesses. Here in the United States, when we retire, what do we get? Social security. That's a very socialist idea. Based on the theories of Adam Smith and the invisible hand. Four basic rights in a free market capitalist society. The right to own property. The right to own a business and keep the profits. The right to freedom of competition. And the right to freedom of choice. What kind of a business do I want to open? After years of planning and saving, Jessica Douglas purchased a building with plenty of room to grow and started a business called Flowers and Weeds. The right to own property and the right to own a business and keep its profits are two of the fundamental rights that exist in, in the economic system called free market capitalism. Would either of these rights be viable without the other? Well, think about it. If you don't have the right to private property, then you don't have the right to run, run the business and to make, the, make your decisions and keep the profits. Neither free market nor command economies are optimal. Free market mechanisms don't respond well to needs of the poor, elderly, or disabled. Remember, free market runs basically on money. So if you don't have money or if you have very little money, you're not a part of that economy. Free market economies may not do enough to protect the environment. Remember, the, the goal of a free market business is to make a profit and give dividends to their stockholders. And on there are times, and there have been many times over the last 200 years, that businesses made decisions that negatively impacted the communities they were in, but positively impacted their bottom line. Many free market economies have adopted social and environmental programs. As I mentioned, social security, and welfare, food stamps, those kinds of things. Socialism and communism don't create wealth or grow economies fast enough. Mixed economies. So obviously we know the word mixed means there's a little of this and a little of that. Some allocation of resources is made by the market and some by the government. So for example, here in the Antelope Valley, how many places can you get internet access. It's not a lot. Economy, <clears throat> economy tends to be called what it, what it most resembles. The U.S. has a mixed economy. How free markets work. 
Decisions about what and how much to produce are made by the market, supply and demand. We've all heard that. That's a, a big economic term. The price tells producers how much to produce. When an item isn't available, the price goes up. And we've been seeing that in the supermarket. When you go to the market and you don't see as many products on the shelves as you usually do, what do you also see? You're seeing a lot higher prices. Prices are not determined by sellers, they are determined by buyers and sellers negotiating in the marketplace. So here we're talking about, I brought up demand and supply, so now we're going to take a look at that. Demand is the economic concept that measures the quantities of goods and services that people are willing to buy at a given price. The lower the price, obviously the higher demand will be. The amount supplied will increase as the price increases. Why? Because the sellers can make money. And we're going to take a look at a supply curve that shows that relationship. The quantity demanded will increase as the price decreases. And we all know, don't we always look for the cheapest price when we're going to buy something? We go on the internet, right? The market price is the price toward which the market will trend. And that will be equilibrium. The place where quantity demanded and quality supplied meet is called the equilibrium point. That's right here. This is the supply curve. Notice <coughs> as the quantity increases, supply goes up. When we put both the supply and demand curves on the same graph, we find that they intersect at a price where the quantity supplied and the quantity demanded are equal. In the long run, the market price will tend toward equilibrium. Four degrees of competition. Perfect, monopolistic, oligopoly, and monopoly. The GDP is the value of the total goods and services produced by the country. That's basically it. A major influence on the growth of GDP is the productivity of the workforce. Unemployment rate. Rate in 2019 was below 4. The rate now is hovering around 3. 4 to 5 percent is typically defined as functional fully full employment. Unemployment statistics don't accurately measure the pain being felt by those who have been unemployed for a long time or those who have simply given up. Remember, if you have given up looking for work, then you're not included in the unemployment rate. Inflation. Inflation is, quote unquote, too many dollars chasing too few goods. We have inflation now. We don't have enough supply. It's been, it's been affected by a number of things, not the least of which is the supply chain has been disrupted for a while, especially during COVID. We weren't getting as many deliveries. So there were few goods. There weren't, there wasn't a lot available. That's why, again, why we're seeing empty shelves. Well, when that happens, there, if there are too many goods, <coughs> too many dollars, People are willing to pay more and more for the few goods that are available. That's inflation. The prices just keep going up. If the prices of goods and services go up by just 7% a year, they will double in 10 years. Then there's disinflation, deflation, prices going down, and stagflation. Okay, inflation and price indexes. The consumer price index where is where the government takes a basket of goods and services that they think is an average basket for come for a family in the United States and they see whether or not the value the cost of that of that basket is going up or down it gives a basic idea as to where the economy is going core inflation some wages and salaries rents and leases tax brackets government benefits and interest rates are based on this data and then the producer, producer price index tracks changes 
in all industries for the goods that manufacturers are using in order to create products. The business cycle has four phases. Economic boom, everybody's buying, everybody's making. Recession, high unemployment, increased business failures, drop in living standards. A recession is typically measured by two full quarters of negative growth in the GDP. In other words, we're making less and less. Depression, only one, and it was in 1930, and it took, a, took, it took World War II to bring us out of it. Recovery leads to an economic boom. Sometimes, if we look at the recession that started in 2000, 2009, it took nine or ten years to get out of that recession. And now we're back in, we may be back in another one. Stabilizing the economy through fiscal policy. Government follows the basic economic theory, Keynesian economic theory, a government policy of increased spending and cutting taxes that could stimulate the economy in a recession. Fiscal policy tools are taxation and government spending. Deficits increase the national debt. We'll be taking a look at that at some time in the near future. This is a chart of the national debt. This has it at $23 trillion as of 2019. $23 trillion. That was before the six, the six trillion that was added for COVID relief. Now on monetary policy, the Federal Reserve is basically the big bank. They manage the actual money, dollars, monetary policy. And what the Fed does, their big tool is to raise or lower the overnight rate that they charge banks to borrow money. If they raise the rate, which they have been over the last six months, they've raised, raised it from near zero to about 3.5% at this point. That charges the banks more for money. Therefore, the banks charge more. They raise their rates for money. So mortgages become more expensive. Business loans become more expensive. Credit cards become more expensive. And as those rates go up, it slows down the economy. So when you have inflation, you're going to start to retract the inflation by raising the interest rates and slowing down the economy. Progress in the agricultural and manufacturing industries. The number of farmers has dropped from about 33% of the population to less than 1% today. Millions of small farmers that farms that existed previously have been replaced by huge corporate farms. Some merely large farms and some small but highly specialized. Farmers went to work in factories. This also happened in the, in the late 1800s during the, uh, the Industrial Revolution. Farmers left the farmers and they went into the cities to work in factories. Many fact manufacturing jobs have been eliminated. So mo a lot of manufacturing moved away from the United States because it's cheaper labor in other countries. However, what we learned during COVID was that when you send all your manufacturing to other countries, in an emergency, you can't create anything for yourself. All of our, uh, all of our PPP the gowns and gloves and masks and all those things, that, all that stuff was coming from China. So when we were in COVID and we weren't getting deliveries from China because they were closed down, we ran out of all kinds of things because we didn't make it here. Agriculture is one of the largest and most important industries in the United States. Technology has increased productivity, and made farmers more efficient. We're looking in here, we're looking at a farmer inside a tractor, but look at all that technology in there. This trend has helped reduce the increase in price of some foods for consumers, but has also reduced the number of small family-run farms. Obviously, with more technology, it costs more. Fastest growing firms are in service. That's where the United States is creating lots of jobs. Law 
health, accounting, entertainment. 80% of the U.S. economy, service industries, and they're pretty good paying jobs. And that will be it for chapter one.